disaffected, mental health researchers are starting to say some of the things that many of us suspected all along. We'll look at a recent study that suggests that it's parental abuse, not just schoolyard bullying, that is creating psychiatric instability in so many gender non-conforming children. And we're gonna do things a little bit differently in this two-part episode. We've been talking on the show about the cluster B personality traits that are so evident in social justice activists. We see their abusive, over-the-top accusations against everyone who disagrees with them or against anyone who defies their commands. But what are they like behind closed doors? We'll take a close look at the abusive parenting style of people with borderline personality disorder. Because what you see in public is often just the tip of a dangerous iceberg, and it's the children who pay the highest price. This is a more personal episode than we've done before. Through movie clips and stories from my childhood, I want to show you what it looks and feels like to be a child prisoner. The people and characters you'll see in this episode are the same kinds of people with the same psychology as the ringleaders of the increasingly frantic social justice warriors who are trying to destroy our cultural fabric. My mother was not normal. These activists are not normal. None of this is normal, and we have to face it directly if we're going to have any chance to stop it. Welcome to Disaffected. I'm Joshua Slocum. This is the show where we talk about the psychology that has pervaded our public life, particularly our political life and our cultural life, as we see on the left. We talk about personality disorders and about abuse dynamics, and we try to draw, excuse me, we try to draw a parallel between the disturbed psychology that some of us are familiar with in the home in domestic abuse, in child abuse, but that I believe we are seeing structuring our political discourse and particularly what people call social justice activism or the woke left. I'm going to do a couple of things here at the beginning of the show. This is going to be a long one. I think we're actually going to break this into two episodes. Uh, but I have a couple of topical things that I want to talk about with you. Uh, and then we're going to get it uh, into a closer look at the phenomenon of the mother with borderline personality disorder. But before we get there, I've told you in past episodes about living in the socialist state of Vermont. Um, this state has gotten absolutely nuts about all things COVID, all things critical race theory. Um, and in prior episodes, I told you a couple of stories about the almost 100 percent compliance with the masking protocols in this state. And I'm not just talking about wearing masks indoors in stores or in restaurants that that request you to wear them. And I'm not just talking about being careful of vulnerable people like our grandparents. I'm talking about out on the street. Before I came into the studio today, I had some errands to run. And it's a beautiful spring day here in Vermont. It's in the 50s. The sun was out. It was a Disney blue sky. The grass is green. The trees haven't budded yet, but but the grass is green and it's growing. And I noticed this week while I was out and about that I'm seeing a few more people who are walking outside without their masks on, which is a great thing. But of course, when you get into downtown Burlington itself, it's all back to 100 percent compliance. And look what comes across Twitter this week from our governor, Phil Scott. And you may want to, if you want a little bit of a grounding in what's been going on here in Vermont, uh, go back to a few episodes ago called The Church of Masketarianism, where I go through the governor's executive orders that have required things like uh, masks within six feet of other people, uh, the executive order banning people from mixing in their households, uh, going out to take a walk with uh, people from another household. These things are completely unconstitutional. They're completely illegal. And no one that I have noticed who has any power, be it political or, or media-wise in Vermont, has uttered a peep about this. And Governor Scott keeps going. 
So as you know, the vaccines are rolling out. And here on Twitter this week, we have Governor Phil Scott who says, if you or anyone in your household identifies as black, indigenous, or a person of color, BIPOC, including anyone with Abenaki or other First Nations heritage, all household members who are 16 years or older can sign up to get a vaccine. Get yours at, and links to the health department. <laughs> oh, where to start? <sighs> I'm gonna start by picking apart the terminology because it's so irritating. Black, indigenous, or person of color, BIPOC. Well, who's, who's included in that? Black people, indigenous, which is their way of avoiding saying Indian or Native American. Person of color, which I suppose is anybody who's non-white, but who are these people? Are they my Somalian neighbors? Probably. Are they my Vietnamese neighbors? Probably. Are they immigrants from other countries who might have a slightly darker skin tone than I am, than I have? Probably. <sighs> this treats people of color, I hate even repeating that phrase, as if there were something about having a different skin tone than the average white person that makes you biologically more vulnerable to getting severely ill or dying from COVID. And as far as I can see, that is simply not true. I don't know that anyone has identified something that black Americans have biologically, that Native Americans or American Indians have biologically, or of course this expansive person of color designation. What could these people possibly have in common biologically that makes them more susceptible? Nothing. And of course, if you argue this with people, they pretend that they don't understand what your issue is with it. They say, well, you know that people of color are lower income and you know that they have more crowded households and you know that they're less likely to have health insurance. Well, first of all, I don't know that for all of them. Yes, obviously, some of those uh, socioeconomic indicators do track uh, with skin color or race and ethnicity. But this is not what the governor's announcement is about. Notice that he says, if you or anyone in your household identifies as, identifies as, this is the same thing that we see with the trans issue, right? Well, I identify as a woman or I identify as non-binary. Can I just go and identify as a person of color or an indigenous person like Elizabeth Warren? <laughs> Apparently, yes. And not only can I simply assert that I am in this category, but anyone in my household who's 16 years of age or older is eligible to get the vaccine because I have identified as a person of color. And I did push back on this a little bit on Twitter, and I got the most insane response from somebody who said, well, well, I said, for example, um, in the town that I live in here in Vermont, uh, there's a very well-known, really popular uh, Thai restaurant called Tiny Thai. There are actually two of them. There's one uh, in my town and one in the next town over. Um, and as far as I can see, I think the owners are uh, a Thai woman and her uh, white American husband. And they've been around for at least 15, maybe 20 years. They do a very brisk trade. The, these people are prosperous business people, right? So these these things about being BIPOC that are supposed to make you more vulnerable, these are proxy indicators, right? It's not actually about the biology. It's not that your skin color makes you more susceptible to COVID. It's that because you have a certain skin color and you're not counted as the average white person, then you are more likely to be low income. You are more likely not to have health insurance. 
I just caught myself there. I almost said, you're more likely not to have access to health insurance. Do you notice that too? We have to put so many modifiers and so many words in front of things because we don't like to speak directly. We can't talk about people who don't have health insurance or can't go to the doctor. We have to talk about people who don't have access to health insurance because we don't like to say that they don't have the money for it. But that's what we really mean. So this couple that owns Tiny Thai is eligible for the vaccine. And this person on Twitter says to me, stop being so disingenuous. You know full well that, uh, uh, that working in a restaurant is a high risk category. This has nothing to do with working in a restaurant. This is about people of color. So if we're gonna talk about proxy indicators, being one of them being, uh, being poor, again, I was gonna say low socioeconomic status, even I get infected by these euphemisms, then we should talk about that. But that's not the case for these people. And, and I said back to this person, I said, wait a minute. The, the governor's announcement here, this eligibility, if you identify as, has nothing to do with working in a restaurant, being in a restaurant. If they wanted to say, okay, we suggest, our, we consider you to be in a high risk category if you're working in a restaurant, you could see the connection there. Tight quarters, people coming in and out all the time. But that's not what it's about. But people will not listen. This is absolutely irrational. It's illogical. And people will not listen. And any time you suggest that there's something wrong with this, that, that it has not been thought through carefully, most people on the left and people who are, you know, as some call branch COVIDians, simply will not. They will not give it to you. They won't acknowledge it. And it's not that they're stupid. And it's not that they're uneducated. They are religiously committed to this. So... Chalk that up to the governor's exceedingly long list of unconstitutional and irrational and probably illegal under the Civil Rights Act uh, orders um, that he's given out here in Vermont. There's so much of it. I could do a whole show on it, but it would bore you because it would all be local politics. <sighs> Something else topical that relates to some things we've talked about in recent shows. An article came out from the Society for Evidence-Based Gender Medicine, SEGM, about a study that took a look at the demographic characteristics of children and adolescents who are diagnosed with what we call gender dysphoria. And as a reminder, gender dysphoria is the current term in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, the DSM, that we give to children who express distress about the fact that they are a boy or a girl because they perceive that they are either born in the wrong body or they don't like things that boys are supposed to like, so that means they must really be a girl, or they don't like things that girls are supposed to like, so that means they must really be a boy. This was called gender identity disorder in the prior version of the DSM, but the activists didn't like that because the word disorder is stigmatizing. So they decided to call it gender dysphoria, which simply means gender unhappiness. And why did they change the name? Well, they changed the name so that they wouldn't have to say disorder. But this is the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, which is a United States publication and is ostensibly the psychiatric bible to classify mental disorder i'm sorry mental dysphorias and is mainly used for billing purposes so for example um i i see a therapist twice a month i do psychotherapy talk therapy and um my therapist can't diagnose me with what i think is the probably the most accurate actual diagnosis of complicated post-traumatic stress disorder or CPTSD because CPTSD is not listed in the DSM so insurance companies won't pay for it. So they wanted to make sure to keep this in the DSM so that treatment could be paid for but they don't want to call it an actual disorder. This is how nonsensical this, this whole conversation is. So here's this study looking at the demographic characteristics of gender dysphoric kids. And it backs up exactly what many of us have suspected all along. 
I'm going to share several quotes here. Those of you who are watching on video will be able to see this, but I'll also read them out because I know that most of you are, are listening on audio only. Although, let me insert this here. If you are listening, thank you, thank you for listening. And thank you for watching. But if you are listening on audio only, this episode today and the next one, if we break this into two, is very visual heavy. We're going to be doing a lot of actual movie clips in this one. So um, if you get a chance, take a look at us um, on Rumble, for example, rumble.com slash disaffected, because you'll get more out of it if you can see uh, what I'm also reading out. So the first one says, gender nonconforming and GD, gender dysphoric, youth experience elevated rates of victimization, discrimination, and prejudice. According to the minority stress theory, these adverse experiences are the primary cause of the poor mental health status of gender dysphoric individuals. So let me explain a few things here. We're looking at the fact that children and adolescents, and this is also true for adults, but, but children and adolescents who are um, diagnosed as gender dysphoric have an extraordinarily high rate of psychiatric distor disorders and neurodevelopmental disorders, things like autism on the neurodevelopmental side and things like um, anxiety, suicidal ideation, self-harm um, on the psychiatric side. So this is known. There's a very, very high correlation. And people are seek, seek to explain this. What, you know, what explains this correlation? One of the explanatory frameworks that's been offered is called the minority stress model. And that means that minorities such as um, gay youth, lesbian youth, um, gender dysphoric or gender non-conforming kids, um, that's the minority category that they belong to. And the idea is that the societal prejudice that underlies mistreatment of people who fit these categories is the significant cause of psychological stress and is therefore the explanatory factor for why these children develop actual psychiatric disorders because of the stress that is put on them by homophobia or by transphobia. And that seems very reasonable to people because there's a part of that that's absolutely true, right? Anybody who is gay or lesbian, anybody who is trans or outwardly gender nonconforming, whether you're an adult or, or an adolescent, will, will know that yes, there are there really are cases of homophobia. There really is mistreatment, depending on your circumstances, depending on where you live. Um, and even if you're not being outright mistreated, the idea that there's something there's something about you that makes you this this strange creature that only fits into a small population that's not like normal people, this stress does affect a person and, and can definitely lead to anxiety and other psychiatric problems. But the minority stress theory model has been pushed by transgender activists because they want to cover up the connections that this study uh, is affirming. They don't want, well, frankly, they don't want the truth aired. So the idea is that anything, any stress that goes wrong, any suicidal ideation, any self-harm, any of these things, this is all caused only by people being transphobic or homophobic to these children and adolescents. But that doesn't really make sense because these sorts of disturbances, mental disturbances that are, that are seen in kids like this often start occurring very, very young, not just when you're 14 or 15 and you finally come out of the closet, but, but much earlier. So let's go on to the next one. There are two issues which contradict the minority stress theory. First, Evidence shows that mental health issues often precede the onset of gender identity concerns. Absolutely true. I've experienced this myself. I've talked about this to you in other episodes, about the fact that even when I was a young kid at five years old wanting to go out for Halloween dressed as a witch um, or liking, you know, liking dressing up as a girl, um, this was already a problem in my household with my mother long before I became sort of out and open to the greater world. Second, long-term studies have not been able to demonstrate lasting mental health benefits of, quote, gender affirmative interventions, hormonal and surgical. So these gender affirming interventions, I, that, listen to that creepy phrase, gender affirming. 
hormonal and surgical. We're talking about putting kids on puberty blockers like the um, toxic cancer drug Lupron. And then we're talking about cross-sex hormones, so giving um, female levels of estrogen to boys or male levels of testosterone to girls. These are the interventions, the gender-affirming care. These findings do not support the argument that minority stress is the primary reason for the high co-occurrence of gender dysphoria and other psychiatric disorders. Surprise, surprise. Next. Instead, the findings suggest that adverse childhood histories and poor attachments may predispose a young person to the onset of gender dysphoria as well as other psychiatric illness and symptoms of distress. So what are we talking about here? This is very clinical language, and a lot of the actors behind these things get written out. Either they're not mentioned at all, or they're talked about only in the passive voice. So I'm going to put this into plain English for you. Adverse childhood histories means abuse and neglect. It means parental abuse or caregiver abuse or neglect. Poor attachments. Attachment theory is the study of how children from the time of infancy through their, their early formative years, how they develop bonds with their parents, right? Are these healthy bonds? Are the infants secure? Are the children secure? Do they trust mom and dad? Uh, are they learning how to relate to other people and develop a sense of self and a sense of other um, that, that feels natural and that they can relate normally to people? So children with, quote, adverse childhood histories, meaning abuse and neglect, often have what are called disordered attachments to their parents. They're insecure attachments or avoidant attachments. These are some of the terms of art. Um, and, and these kinds of disordered attachments or disordered bonds to the parents um, are primarily come from mistreatment by the parents. The parent is personality disordered or is in some way neglectful. So what they're saying here uh, is exactly what I would expect this to find, that um, childhood abuse and neglect and children who are insecurely or badly attached to their parents, this happens before the child expresses so-called gender dysphoria or what used to be called gender identity disorder. Next one. Whew. 88% of children and adolescents from the gender dysphoric group had a comorbid mental health diagnosis, 88%. Approximately 50% of them had a history of self-harm and reported suicidal ideation. 60% had experienced bullying. Look at this. Look at this. 88% of children and adolescents from the gender dysphoric group that they studied had a comorbid mental health diagnosis. That's a lot. That's most. In fact, I, I rather question what was going on with this other 12%. And approximately 50% of them had a history of self-harm and reported suicidal ideation. 60% had experienced bullying. That was certainly the case for me. I had been bullied, as I've said in past shows, for being a sissy boy since primary school. And by the time I was 12, I was already trying to kill myself. Next one, gender dysphoric youth with at-risk patterns of attachment were more likely to come from families with a low socioeconomic status, this is their way of saying, avoiding saying poor families, and more likely to have experienced maltreatment, physical abuse, sexual abuse, emotional abuse, neglect, and exposure to domestic violence. All of that all of that went on in my family. I was not actually sexually abused, to my knowledge, um, but all of those things were factors. Next one. Consequently, the results dispute the appropriateness of immediate affirmation through social or medical means as the first line and the one and only therapeutic approach for treating gender dysphoric youth. The study findings make a strong case for a more nuanced and in-depth exploration of children and adolescents' clinical presentation of gender dysphoria with the goal of identifying treatment pathways that prioritize long-term health outcomes. So again, in plain English, the data does not suggest that it's a good idea 
to block children's puberty and to tell them, yes, you really are a boy born in a girl's body. And yes, we should be putting you on a pathway to getting surgery to castrate you and invert your penis and turn it into a vagina, or if you're a girl, to give you a radical mastectomy and remove your breasts, uh, and then possibly go on to what is known as phalloplasty, which is so disgusting. I urge you, actually, to look up phalloplasty online. I want you to take a look at what this procedure is. It's what it sounds like. It's building a penis. And do you know how they do that? I'm not going to show you the pictures here, but you can find them online, and let me tell you, they are horrifying. They take a young woman's arm, they slice here around the wrist, and they peel back the skin all the way down to the elbow to harvest tissue to make a flesh tube that they then attach to the blood vessels in the groin to make a fake penis. And you end up with a gloved arm. You, you, are, you will literally, when you, when you go online and look at this, you will see young women it looks like an, an anatomical model, a preserved cadaver. All the skin is stripped. You can see the musculature underneath it. It looks like a skeleton with sinew on it. It is the most disgusting Frankenstein thing you'd ever seen. That's phalloplasty. That's gender-affirming care for these girls. So as always, I'm willing to be wrong. And if I'm if somebody presents evidence to me that indicates that there is a different explanatory pathway than this, I will consider it. But I don't think they're going to. This is what's really going on. I feel confident in saying this. As you know, I don't believe there's any such thing as a gender identity. I believe that there are people and children who believe that they have an internal sense that they're supposed to be the opposite sex. Remember, I told you in the last episode. That happened to me. I believed that I was a mistake. I used to pray to God at night uh, that I would either be a normal boy who didn't think about girly things and didn't think about boys in that naughty way that I thought about them, or that I would wake up a girl because I had a birth defect and, and I was a genetic anomaly. Yes, people do actually believe this inter and, and they internalize this, but it isn't real. It's a psychological disturbance. It's mental illness. Most of these children will turn out to be gay. I've seen estimates from between 60 to 90% of them uh, turning out to be gay. I strongly suspect it's closer to 90%. It is true, and I have known such children, and I've known adults who are heterosexual, uh, who, who've talked to me about their history. Um, there are heterosexual straight kids, or kids who will turn out to be straight as they go through puberty, uh, who were, quote, gender nonconforming, sissy boys and butch girls. Never had any homosexual inclinations, uh, but got treated the same way. And, and when those children get picked on, when they get bullied, they are experiencing homophobic bullying, even though they themselves are not homosexual. But most of them turn out to be gay. Study after study after study shows this. This is transing the gay away. This is monstrous medical mutilation practice on gay children. And where does it come from? What kinds of things go on that make a kid feel this way? Before we go to the break, I'm going to set up the next few segments for you. And I want to tell you that this is not going to be an easy episode to watch. It's not going to be easy for me to do. Um, I'm nervous about it right now. It's graphic and it's personal. We're going to look at what it is like to grow up in a household headed by a mother deranged with borderline personality disorder. And I'm not, I'm offering this to you, I'm inviting you. I'm inviting you, if you are somebody who grew up with a mother or a father like mine, I want you to recognize that this happens to other people this is only the 12th episode of this show, but I'm already getting emails from people who say, oh my God, I thought it was only my father who did this, or I can't believe the story you told. You literally were writing my childhood. This is the first time I've ever known 
that it wasn't just my mother who was crazy in this particular way, or I had no idea there was a psychiatric category. I had no idea there was an explanation for why my mother treated us the way she did. So if you are one of those people who grew up in a household like mine, I, I, I offer this to you. I want you to recognize that you're not the only one that other people went through it. And if you are a listener or a viewer who thankfully did not experience this kind of child abuse, I'm inviting you to look behind the closed front door. I want you to know what this can look like when no one else is watching. I didn't know when I was a child whether anybody knew what my mother was doing. I, I think probably some people suspected, but I think that even, even those teachers and guidance counselors would have been horrified if they could see what was really going on in our household. So um, we're going to get right into it. We're going to talk about it in detail, and I'm going to show it in graphic detail. Um, we're going to use a couple of movies. <laughs> this is, and this is the part where, where I have to talk about the fact that things that aren't funny are also funny. Two movies that I have, I, well, that obsessed me as a child and that I've maintained an interest in my entire life. Mommy Dearest and Carrie the 1976 horror film, Carrie. These are movies that are, well, Mommy Dearest, of course, is the film depiction from Christina Crawford's memoir called Mommy Dearest. Christina Crawford was the adopted daughter of movie star Joan Crawford. Um, and the movie is widely panned for being over the top and ridiculous. Um, and it's become something of a, uh, of a camp cult classic. I'm not quite sure why it hasn't risen to the level of popularity of the Rocky Horror Picture Show, because God is an awful lot of fun to go to a midnight screaming of Mommy Dearest, um, bringing your old, co your own cold cream to put on and your wire hangers. Um, but it is certainly something that almost all gay men know. And the 1976 movie Carrie was the filmed version of Stephen King's first book of the same title, Carrie. And nominally, it, it's a supernatural story. It's the story of, of a teenage girl named Carrie and her mother, Margaret, Carrie and Margaret White. Carrie is telekinetic, meaning she has psychic powers. She can move objects. She can make them fly about. Her mother is a deranged religious fanatic, um, played by Piper Laurie, um, Sissy Spacek, played Carrie. Piper Laurie played her mother, Margaret White. Um, and people look at the role of Margaret White and say, oh my God, it's, it's so histrionic, it's so over the top. And it is histrionic, it is heightened. Even Piper Laurie, who played, who played Margaret White, still in interviews says, she laughed out loud when she got the script because she said nobody could actually act that way. Uh, and I played it so unbelievably over the top. There's a reason why this movie terrified me and compelled me when I was a child. And it's because it looked like home. It's only slightly more histrionic than the woman that I grew up with. Only very slightly. And so neither of these movies exactly describes the household that I grew up in, but there are striking parallels and similarities. I mean, if people, if you ask me for a one sentence description of what kind of person was your mother, what do I need to know about her to get the feel? I would say my mother is a trailer park Joan Crawford, a cross between a trailer park Joan Crawford and Margaret White and Carey. My mother was not a religious fanatic. Um, but in many ways, her delusions and derangements had a, a, a sort of religious mania quality to them. So we're going to take a break here, and then we're going to come back, and we're going to start looking at these two movies. And I'm going to draw some parallels for you, and um, see you on the other side. Hey, listeners, guess what? We're on Patreon now. Bringing you this show costs money. Would you chip in to help? Go to patreon.com slash disaffected. That's patreon.com forward slash D-I-S 
A-F-F-E-C-T-E-D. Thank you. This is a scene with Joan Crawford going to her daughter Christina's bedroom at night. She's going through the closet. She's got cold cream all over her face. She's sorting through her clothes. And she finds something that makes her angry. Christina, her daughter, is uh, pretending to be asleep in the next room. She's picking up a dress on a hanger, and she's walking over to Christina's bed. in this closet when I told you no wire hangers ever! I work and work till I'm half dead and I hear people saying she's getting old. What do I get? A daughter who cares as much about the beautiful dresses I give her as she cares about me! What's wire hangers doing in this closet? Answer me! Christine is cowering on the bed. Beautiful dresses, and you treat them like Jones pulling everything out of the closet. You two, three hundred dollar dress on a wire hanger. We'll see how many you've got in your hidden some here. We'll see. We'll see. Get out of that bed. She's pulling all of her clothes out of the closet and throwing it on the floor. We're going to see how many wire hangers you've got in your closet. Why? Why? Christina, get out of that bed. Get out of that bed. She's about to start whipping her with a hanger. Beautiful house in Brentwood, and you don't care if your clothes are unspatched from wire hangers. Jones walking into the bathroom that is connected to the bedroom suite. And she's looking at the floor. She finds a spot. Did you scrub the bathroom floor today? Did you? Yes, Mommy. Yes, Mommy, dearest. When I told you to call me that, I wanted you to mean it. She's dragging her into the bathroom. Look at the floor. You call that clean, do you? Miss Jenkins said it was clean. Jenkins said it was clean. Do you think it's clean? Do you think it's clean? Look at that. Do you? Yes, I do. She's throwing her to the floor. Scouring power is going to start flying everywhere. Clean this floor. You and me together. Go. Go scrub hard. This floor is already clean. It's not. I just this floor is not clean. Look at it. This floor is not clean. She's hitting her with the scouring powder.
Give it up. <clears throat> this is a very famous scene. Most people know this scene. If they know nothing else from this movie, they know this scene. And it's, um, it's over the top. Drag queens do it. I did parodies of it when I did drag in college. And it's a case of things that aren't funny at all being very funny. But that kind of humor, that camp humor that gay men have, it's a defense. You either acknowledge the horror of what you're living through in front of you, or you make a joke about it. And sometimes you do both. Joan Crawford was an extraordinarily troubled woman. <laughs> you don't say, Slocum. Um, I, I have a lot to say about this. I, I told you in past episodes that I read Mommy Dearest when my mother wasn't looking. Um, I think she'd gotten it out of the library or she had the paperback in the house. And um, this movie is, uh, uh, came out in 1981. And in, from 1980 to 1984, we lived in Orange County in Southern California. And... Um, <laughs> That's when cable television um, came out, and this um, this used to run on HBO after it was done with its theatrical release, um, and sometimes on other channels. Back in those days, um, you know, I know some people in a generation behind me had two or three channels. Uh, when I was a kid, uh, you had up to eleven channels um, if you had the right kind of uh, antenna and bunny ears. And, and in the, you know, so for those of you who grew up in a world uh, when you didn't have entertainment on demand, you had to wait until the next week for the next episode of a show to come out. There was no such thing as binging. Um, and if you wanted to see a movie again that had been in popular wide release, you had to wait for it to be reshown uh, on network or syndicated television. Mommy Dearest was on a very heavy rotation. And my sister and I were not allowed to watch it. Um, if my mother saw us watching it, um, we had to watch something else. But... We, um, we would watch this absolutely transfixed because this is how our mother acted. Joan Crawford was an alcoholic. My mother was not. You don't need alcohol to act this way. It helps, but it isn't necessary. And Joan Crawford has functioned as, for me, it's something like a muse, but that's not quite the right word for it. I, I have been fascinated with her and with portrayals of her since I was a young child, and, and for reasons that did not become clear and obvious to me until I hit my 40s. And if you're wondering if this is the reason why so many other gay men are fascinated with, with her and with women like her, I'm here to tell you that I think it is. I think this was a way of understanding and exploring my mother in a safer way than acknowledging the truth of who she really was. One of the things that you start thinking about when you come to reckon honestly with your past and what happened in your house. People tell you to have empathy for your parents, right? To understand them. People mean different things by empathy. And a lot of people mean sympathy. They're not the same thing. A lot of people want, a lot of people wanted me to have sympathy for my mother. 
she's a very sick woman, they'd say when I, I'd recount something like this. Well, yes, indeed, she was. She is. But it's too much to ask a child who was treated like this growing up to have direct sympathy for somebody. I couldn't even admit that a lot of this was real for a long time. And so I don't know if sublimation is the right word, but Joan Crawford was a stand-in for my mother. And I it was easier and it has been easier for me to understand and empathize with the kind of person she is by doing it through... Joan Crawford rather than directly with my mother. That scene could have been could have been filmed in our house. My mother would come into the bedroom. He never knew when this was going to happen. Would you come into the bedroom in the dead of night and turn on the overhead light? And start going through my drawers, seeing whether I had folded my clothes correctly. Did I mate the socks right? Weren't allowed to, to take the socks and turn the tops inside out. That would wear out the elastic. That would get you a punishment. You had to just fold them together. And if things weren't folded correctly, if there were shirts in the top, under, everything, the underwear had to be in the top, the socks had to be on the top, the socks had to be on the left of the drawer, the underwear had to be on the right of the drawer. And if you got something wrong, it got thrown out, and it got thrown out on the floor. Do it over. And when she really angered herself up, she would pull me out of bed, sometimes by the scruff of the neck, <laughs> my collar, or she'd take my ear and twist it. She'd twist my ear until I screamed and then pull me downstairs and go into the kitchen at midnight and start going through the dish drainer, looking for spots on the dishes. It was uncannily like this scene. And like young Christina, I couldn't see what was wrong with the dishes. I couldn't see the spots that she could see because they were in her mind even if they weren't, you know, what kind of crazy person goes through the dish drainer, pulls out a dish, finds a water spot on it, and gets up in their child's face and says, does this look clean to you? Does this fucking look clean? And if I didn't answer correctly or if I took too long, I'd get backhanded across the face or I'd get cuffed on the back of the neck. Why are you doing this to me, she'd say. Why the fuck are you doing this to me? There's a book that I want to recommend to you. If you want to understand what it's like for children of borderline mothers, there is only one book that really captures it. It's comprehensive and was a revelation to me. It's called Understanding the Borderline Mother by Dr. Christine Ann Lawson. Well worth your time. It's expensive. It's not a cheap book. Expect to spend at least 60 to $75 on it. It's worth every penny. I want to read you a few things from Understanding the Borderline Mother. Um, Dr. Lawson, I don't know an awful lot about her, but she has treated patients, clients um, who are victims of borderline parents, um, some of her patients, I'm sure, develop borderline personality disorder themselves. Um, and I have never seen an examination of this psychiatric syndrome that so thoroughly understands both the motivations of, of the person, the mother, with borderline personality disorder, but also the inner landscape of her children. She says this, Children who grow up with borderline mothers live in a make-believe world that is neither fiction nor fantasy. Borderland is an emotional world where loving mothers resemble storybook characters. Helpless waifs, frightened hermits, bossy queens, or vindictive witches. This whimsically dangerous world is filled with contradiction and fraught with emotional storms that defy prediction. A seven-year-old patient drew a picture of her borderline mother as a wicked witch, 
threatening to turn her into a frog with a wave of a magic wand. Trapped in a world that others cannot see, feel, or understand, the borderline's child feels hopelessly lost. Christina Crawford, the adopted daughter of actress Joan Crawford, grew up with a mother like this and described her experience in her famous autobiography. Quote, Each time I ran headlong into an abyss, that black hole where nothing followed logically, where fabrication and anger and turmoil ruled supreme, that place where there was no help and no peace, no escape from the juggernaut of chaos. From her throne in the eye of the hurricane, brandishing, brandishing her magic wand of obsession, ruled the queen of chaos herself, Mommy Dearest. Lawson uses the framework of fairy tales to categorize the different faces and the different aspects of the borderline mother. And some of these faces, some mothers display all of them, some cycle through them, some show predominantly one face, but may put on a different mask in a different situation. And, and she, she breaks them into the waif, the hermit, the witch, and the queen. What I'm talking about with my mother has been all of these people. But what I, what really characterized our childhood was my mother, the witch, the vindictive witch, and the queen sometimes. This is how she describes the witch mother. The darkness within the borderline witch is annihilating rage. Her inner experience is the conviction of being evil, and her behavior evokes submission. The witch can hide in, in any of the other three profiles as a temporary ego state. She is filled with self-hatred and may single out one child as the target of her rage. The witch's emotional message to her children is, life is war. The Medean mother is the most pathological and rarest type of witch. I want to, um, I want to acquaint you with the clinical description of the symptoms of borderline personality disorder. Kevin, can we put up the graphic that lists those nine different characteristics, please? These are um, from Dr. Lawson's book, but they, they closely mirror um, the descriptions of uh, the symptoms of borderline personality disorder that you'll find in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. So they are. Number one, frantic efforts to avoid real or imagined abandonment. Number two, a pattern of unstable and intense relationships. Number three, unstable self-image or sense of self. Number four, impulsiveness and behavior that could be self-destructive, spending, sex, substance abuse, reckless driving, binge eating. Number five, suicidal gestures, threats, or self-mutilating behavior, hitting, cutting, or burning oneself. Number six, intense moodiness, rapid mood changes. Number seven, feelings of emptiness. Number eight, inappropriate, intense anger. And number nine, stress-induced, paranoid thoughts or dissociative symptoms. Loses touch with reality. Not everybody with borderline personality disorder has all nine of those symptoms. Um, and when you do diagnosis through the DSM, I believe the, cu the cutoff is that... Um, in order to, to qualify for a diagnosis that somebody has to consistently exhibit at least five of the nine traits. But I can tell you that my mother has, has exhibited all of them um, repeatedly. Um, you'll see some of this in, in a couple more clips that I'm gonna show you later in the, in the show. Uh, but there was a little bit of it that peeked through in, in that scene um, that I just showed you. And again, these are, this is what Christina Crawford called a night raid. And that's a term that I use as well because it's better than any other I've found. It's hard to hear the dialogue, but um, 
Joan Crawford um, came from incredible poverty and child abuse herself. Uh, she was born in Texas, in San Antonio, I believe. Single mother, who in those days, uh, somebody that might have been described as a slattern. Um, very likely sexually abused at a young age, uh, perhaps quasi-incestuously by her mother's husband. They're treated very, very badly. Um, it's like my mother. She came by her craziness, honestly. And in that scene, she tells Christina that her her messy, horrible room looks like some two-bit apartment in a backstreet town in Oklahoma. Joan Crawford. Joan Crawford's name was Lucille Lesur. She got the name Joan Crawford after one of the movie magazines ran a um, Name the New Starlet contest. And she built a woman called Joan Crawford that she presented to the world. And she fought and fought to be better than the white trash background that she came from. She was deeply ashamed of where she came from. And she didn't ever want to go back there. And my mother came by her crazy the hard way, too. She was born in 1955 in upstate New York. And her parents, my mother's parents, <clears throat> I think her mother probably had borderline personality disorder as well. Both of her parents were alcoholics. Um, my mother's father died. I can't remember if she was 11 or 12 years old when he died, but it was young. And that left my grandmother to care for my mother and her, my mother's younger sister. My grandmother had nine children who lived. I believe that she had two stillbirths and several abortions. And they were by two different husbands. And her first husband was floridly abusive. And um, seven of my mother's siblings come from that marriage. Um, my mother and her younger sister were the only two offspring of my grandmother's last marriage. And they lived in poverty, what you might call Appalachia of the North. House had running water, but that's all it had. It had cold running water, no hot water, no, um, no bathroom indoors. They had an outhouse, not very much money. And my mother's younger sister, Connie, was born when my grandmother was Again, have a heavy drinker the whole time. And my grandmother was 44 or 45 years old when she gave birth to Connie, a few years after she gave birth to my mother. Connie was born in 1969. Connie is deceased. Connie was um, profoundly mentally retarded. The best guess I could give you was that she may have had the mental ability of a five-year-old, but it doesn't map directly onto, um, onto how she was um, the... Her brain was very malformed, and she needed an extraordinary amount of care, Connie did. In those days, it was shameful to have a retarded child, um, and there, there was not very much help for parents like my grandparents. Um, they didn't have all the special schools that they have now or the sheltered workshops, and also my grandparents were fucked up beyond belief and spent the first few years pretending that Connie was normal until they couldn't ignore it anymore. And they were urged to institutionalize her and they refused to do so. And so they kept her at home and she acted out. She had temper tantrums, violent temper tantrums. Um, poor girl. And from what my mother described, almost all of the parental care had to go to Connie. And as a result, my mother was neglected. She told me stories about how when they would have Christmas, there were very few gifts. So, so each child really only got one special gift. And um, my mother got a doll for Christmas. 
And Connie took a liking to this doll and really, really wanted the doll and cried and screamed. Um, and my grandparents took my, that doll from my mother and, and gave it to Connie and would say things like, I'm just going to go ahead and name her. My mother's name is Bonnie. Bonnie, why are you so selfish? Connie doesn't know any better. She's, she'll always be a little girl. She needs that doll more than you. Why don't you give it to her? You can imagine how a child felt to be treated that way by her parents. Not to feel like they loved her as much as they loved the other daughter. Always to be put second. Always to be asked to sacrifice herself for somebody who needed mother and daddy's love more. But it curdled my mother. My mother was intensely jealous and resentful of Connie. She hated her. She absolutely hated her. And for decades would rant and scream about her fucking retarded sister. It was almost as if she took her anger out on Connie herself rather than on her own parents. I'm not sure why. Um, I suspect, I have, I can't prove this, but I strongly suspect there was sexual abuse in my mother's childhood home as well, and I, I, I very strongly suspect that it happened with Connie. My mother told horrific stories of My grandparents apparently claimed that Connie was chronically constipated and um, would subject her to enemas almost every single day. Maybe she needed them, maybe she didn't, but according to my mother, she screamed. So my mother came from, a, from, from an insane and, and, and deranged household. <clears throat> And it shaped how she had children. I want to read you, I want to read you a little bit more from the borderline mother. Because this applies, this applies to all children. But you can quickly see, you can easily see how damaging this can be when it goes wrong. So... The first thing we must understand in life is our mother. Recognizing her face, the sound of her voice, the meaning of her facial expressions, the meaning of her moods is so universal, so natural and normal, and so crucial to survival that we scarcely give it a thought. In fact, we forget how much we know about her despite having powerful reactions to a certain gesture, a tone of voice, a facial expression in someone else. The, that person, of course, often being our spouse. Understanding our mother is the first step to understanding ourselves. Borderline personality disorder is defined as a, quote, pervasive pattern of instability of interpersonal relationships, self-image, and affect, and marked impulsivity, end quote. The term borderline means that their emotional state can border between psychosis and neurosis, particularly when faced with abandonment or rejection. Thus, children with borderline mothers grow up in a contradictory and confusing emotional world. I want to explain neurosis and psychosis to you. The term borderline personality disorder, some clinicians call it a misnomer. They wish that, that, that the disorder weren't, weren't named that, but it actually speaks to something worth thinking about, the borderline between psychosis and neurosis. And this comes originally out of Freudian thinking. Neurosis describes emotional dysfunctions in people, but that fall within the normal range. People may be more or less neurotic, anxiety-ridden, um, quote, hung up on certain things, um, likely to repeat the same patterns of bad relationships uh, over and over again. But neurosis is on the less extreme end. So, you know, you can describe people with normal range personalities as being 
more or less neurotic. Psychosis refers to actually losing touch with reality, being delusional, uh, whether that is um, actual vis uh, visual hallucinations or auditory hallucinations or, or paranoid hallucinations, which is something that comes up a lot um, in particularly low periods in people with borderline personality disorder. And one way to describe borderline personality disorder is, um, I can't remember who said this, it's a great description. Um, they're stably unstable, right? They're, they're constantly fluctuating between high neurosis and psychosis. So an example of, of, of breaking and losing touch with reality would be um, a borderline. Uh, uh, I've, seen the, I've seen this in friends. I've seen it in my mother. Um, if my mother was feeling particularly stressed or anxious about something and really wanted my reassurance or really wanted me to come over to her house and uh, help her um, write checks for bills or whatever it was, she would text and text and text. And if I couldn't text back immediately, if I couldn't respond to her, she would begin constructing this hallucinatory fantasy that I hated her, that um, I was deliberately not answering the phone or not answering her texts. Um, that I was talking about her to my sister, that I was making up lies. I mean, it could get really Baroque. Um, that's one of the ways that they can go over the border from, from neurosis into psychosis. Christine Lawson also says, children of borderlines are not only at risk for developing borderline personality disorder, but in some cases, the lives of both mother and child can be endangered. Trust is a major issue between borderlines and their children. Children cannot trust the borderline mother for many reasons. Number one, she is manipulative. Two, she distorts the truth and may even blatantly lie. Three, she may physically harm them. Four, she is unpredictable. Five, she overreacts. Six, she is impulsive. Seven, she has poor judgment. Eight, she has an unreliable memory. Nine, she is inconsistent. 10, she is intrusive. Like Alice who confided in the Cheshire cat, children of borderlines may learn to trust a pet more than their own mother. <laughs> the rage, the accusations, and the the projection, the fits that people like Joan Crawford had, that my mother had, that maybe your mother or father had, are reflections of terrors that live inside them, inadequacies that live inside them, fears about their own self-worth or the lack of it. I want to show you a, another shorter clip from Mommy Dearest, um, and to set this up, no, no, I'm not going to set it up. Let's just, um, Kevin, let's roll the scene from Mommy Dearest um, with Christina sitting in front of Joan Crawford's dressing table. Oh, yes. It was thrilling. I'm so grateful to you all. My wonderful fans. You've made me a star. Oh, yes. It was thrilling. I'm so grateful to you all. My wonderful fans who have made me a star. Mommy! What do you think you're doing? Nothing, Mommy. I was just, just playing. What do you mean, playing? Going through my things? Making fun of me? I wasn't making fun of you. I was just trying to... I was acting. Play acting. Like you're always doing. What have you put on your head? What have 
you sorry. jumped to the stamp. I'm sorry. Ow. I was just setting lotion. Oh, Mom, ow. <laughs> what are you doing? Don't, don't you oh, tell mommy, me what don't. I'm doing. Don't tell me. Don't. Oh, no. Mommy, I look awful. Yeah, I know you look <laughs> awful. You be quiet. You're always rummaging through my drawers, trying to find a way to make people look at you. Why are you always looking at yourself in the mirror? Why are you doing that? Tell me. You sit She's down cutting now. her hair off. This ought to teach you. You vain, Mommy, are you spoiled. Like I'd rather you go bald to school than looking like a tramp. I want to point out a couple of things in that scene. You know, and I should also say this. Christina Crawford does not like this movie. She didn't approve of it. She didn't like the way it was done. Uh, Christina wrote two or three scripts when she sold the movie rights. Uh, they didn't accept any of her scripts, uh, the movie rights to her book, Mommy Dearest, which came out in 1977. This movie was made in 1981. Um. And I'm not going to gainsay Christina. This was her mother and this is her story. But she said that that her book was about a child trying to get through a war zone with a mother like Joan, but that, that Paramount had made just another Joan Crawford picture. And there's some truth to that. I mean, the way this movie is shot, if you know any of Joan Crawford's work, you could you can see sets, you can see lighting choices, you can even see uh, particular behaviors that come straight out of some of uh, Crawford's biggest pot boilers like Queen Bee. In a sense, this was another Joan Crawford picture. Uh, Faye Dunaway, the, 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 the physical resemblance and the mannerisms is, is utterly uncanny. Um, uh, her representation of Joan Crawford certainly looks... Um, looks and sounds the way Crawford did in a lot of her pictures. Um, but whether or not Christina Crawford finds the film portrayal to be accurate to her life, if you dial it down just a little bit, um, it, it certainly rings true for a person like my mother and for some other people I've known who've had mothers like mine. Yes, there really are. There really are parents like this. There really are. Um, but what she says in this scene, you can hear her. You can hear Joan Crawford talking about her own inner demons. Why are you always looking at yourself in the mirror? Why are you doing that? You vain, spoiled, selfish child. I'd rather you go to school bald than looking like a tramp. She's talking about herself. She's talking about her own insecurities. She's talking about the fact that she feels like a tramp. She feels cheap, shallow, vain, and she doesn't want to face these things about herself. So she takes them out on Christina. And this is what borderline mothers do. They project the demon inside of themselves onto their children. When my mother would, when my mother would go on one of her tears, and she would often say, why are you doing this to me? In the middle of slapping me or terrorizing me, she'd take me by the shoulders and shake me and look in my face and say, why are you doing this to me? Not cleaning the dishes properly was doing something to her. Um, not folding my clothes properly was doing something to her. I'm not exactly sure what 
demon she was trying to exercise, but she was certainly projecting her inner state onto her children. This is a very heavy episode. And I think we're going to end the first half here. This is a lot to take, a lot to think about, and I think it's better broken up into two. But I want to say thank you for joining me for this episode of Disaffected. We're going to pick this up in the next episode next week, and we're going to use um, another not funny film that's very funny and also very illustrative. We're going to talk about Carrie. See you next time. Thanks so much for listening. Would you take just a minute right now and share our show on social media? On Disaffected, we take a close look every week at the abuse dynamics exploding in the dark and disordered world that we live in. Tell other people about us. Want to talk back to us? You're in luck. Call our listener line and leave us a message. 202-979-2480. That's 202 979 2480. And remember, we do reserve the right to play messages on the air. Hey, listeners, guess what? We're on Patreon now. Bringing you this show costs money. Would you chip in to help? Go to patreon.com slash disaffected. That's patreon.com forward slash D-I-S-A-F-F-E-C-T-E-D. Thank you.